coming up on Market to Market. Pipeline protesters get another day in court. The farm safety net catches a few producers. And southern catfish farmers push back against imports. Those stories and market analysis with Tom Fitzenmeyer next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, October 7 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Eight years after the end of the Great Recession, the economy continues on a slow but bumpy road to recovery. While not fast enough for some, it appears to be fast enough for the Fed. One signpost along that road was the Labor Department's announcement this week, 156,000 jobs were created last month. Despite being below market expectations, confidence in the labor market spurred more people to look for work. That change bumped the unemployment rate up to 5% in September. Creighton University's nine-state Mid-America Business Conditions Index slumped in September, staying five points below growth neutral. Concerns over the expected interest rate hike helped pull the index lower. And last week's announcement of reduced oil pumping by OPEC nations helped crude briefly crack the $50 per barrel ceiling late in the week for the first time since July 1st. That surge in oil prices makes the work being done on the Dakota Access Pipeline a bit more appealing to investors, but not to those who continue to oppose it. John Torpy reports. A Native American tribe opposing the Dakota Access Pipeline received pointed questions from federal appellate court judges this week. The Standing Rock Sioux Tribe is trying to extend a work stoppage on the approximately 1,100-mile pipeline across a small stretch of North Dakota. Last month, the tribe was successful in getting a federal judge to stop construction on the pipeline that spans four states and is nearly completed. Private companies who support the project oppose the tribe's request to extend the work stoppage. Tribal members say the $3.8 billion project impacts religious and cultural sites and is a threat to the water supply at Lake Ohio. The Army Corps of Engineers, which controls the land around the lake, halted all work on the pipeline while their decision-making process regarding pipelines is reevaluated. The Standing Rock Sioux Tribe is suing the Army Corps of Engineers over permits granted to energy transfer partners, the pipeline's owners. No ruling on the extension is expected anytime soon. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. Payments to farmers have always been a controversial topic. Payouts have taken many forms, including monetary returns for staying off ecologically sensitive land, cutting checks for weather disasters, and compensation for extremely low prices. Despite political headwinds, a safety net has always been in place to keep agriculture's engine running. Colleen bradford Krantz explains. The USDA this week began sending out what will amount to nearly $8 billion in 2015 commodity support payments to American farmers. Producers, many facing lower commodity prices with the current year's crop, will find the safety net money in their mailboxes over the coming months. Price loss coverage, or PLC, and agricultural risk coverage, or ARC, both county and individual replaced the previous direct payment program after passage of the 2014 Farm Bill. The change brought an end to what opponents to the legislation called guaranteed payments under the previous law. Producers who signed up for ARC or PLC last year made five-year commitments, and those decisions required a bit of guessing on grain prices in future years. Many farmers, including one Iowa row crop producer, chose ARC because PLC is considered more beneficial only when prices drop dramatically. With PLC, the price has to be under 370 for corn and 840 for soybeans. So I guess we're banking on prices being higher than that. So were other farmers. 76% of the enrolled base acres are in the ARC County program. 
and falling prices in 2016 may make for another year of safety net payments to the 1.7 billion enrolled farms. In 2014, Ark County paid the owners of 900,000 farms a total of $4.4 billion for all crops. Data for the same program in 2015 shows initial safety net payments of $5.6 billion paid to the owners of 1.2 million farms. USDA officials said the PLC program paid about $800,000 to 90,000 operations in 2014. But so far, that has grown to $1.2 billion among 350,000 operations in the 2015 crop year. Officials said that ARC individual data is not yet available, as those payments, as well as payments for 11 of the 21 covered commodities, have yet to be processed. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz. According to USDA, catfish production leads the pack when it comes to U.S. aquaculture. While often a fried food headliner, catfish promoters have been touting the healthier grilled options. And as producer Delaney Howell found, domestic growers have been strengthening their multi-billion dollar reputation while fighting foreign competition and adjusting to new inspection regimes. The day for Battlefish Farm's harvest crew starts early. They've been waiting 18 months for this pond of catfish to be ready. Bill Battle, a native of Tunica, Mississippi, and owner of Battlefish Farms, has raised catfish since he can remember. My first recollection of fish farming was uh, riding in the back of a car, watching the little sack fry we had in a bag to bring to the first pond we ever built. And, and, uh, and I guess that was about 1969 or 70. And uh, from there, went on to run the hatcheries and, and, uh, and worked on a fish farm every holiday and summer vacation that everybody else went to Florida, I went to the fish farm. Battle, a Catfish Farmers of America board member, says raising and processing fish at his operation takes up every one of the 24 hours available in a day and requires the help of some 150 employees. Britton Hatcher is the Mississippi Farm Bureau's aquaculture commodity advisor. Catfish in the wild are bottom feeding fish, but the way I try to explain catfish in a farm raised setting, it's just like cattle. Grass fed beef has a different taste than does feedlot. Catfish are the same. In the wild, they're gonna be a little bit different. If you ever watch a catfish being fed, they go out there and throw feed on the water and our fish are just churning all along the top. They're not at the bottom. Battle Fish Farm's 100 ponds produce nearly 10 million pounds of fish every year. When the catfish are ready, a crew harvests the bounty with nets that allow the smaller fish to swim through, letting them grow to a size that turns a profit. Pride of the Pond Battle's processing facility opened in the early 1980s and runs four days per week, depending on demand and the number of fish harvested in nets or purchased from other producers. U.S. farm-raised catfish production soared in the 70s, topping out in the early 2000s. But after foreign imports from trading partners like Vietnam and China, higher production costs, and a weak domestic economy, contributed to total catfish pond acreage falling nearly 65 percent. Today, Mississippi, Alabama, and Arkansas account for 90 percent of all U.S. production, which tipped the scales at 315 million pounds in 2015, nearly a third of total domestic consumption. Over the past four and a half decades, producers have encountered many changes. Battle and the nearly 185 other catfish producers, concentrated in southern states, are facing some of their greatest challenges in the history of the industry. My father was really involved in the industry and he came home one day and said, look, the malachite that you're using, you got to get rid of it. If the FDA or whoever finds it on the farm, they'll shut, shut us down. You know, it still mystifies me why other countries can use all those banned items and send the fish in here for us to eat and for us to feed our children. You know, if they catch me using it in this country, it's doomsday for me and I don't want to use it. I mean, I want a product that's good for me and good for my kids. I probably eat more catfish than anybody. 
Prior to March 2016, catfish imports and domestic production were inspected and monitored by the Food and Drug Administration. Years of lobbying in Congress resulted in catfish being classified as a meat in the 2008 Farm Bill. After nearly eight years, inspection authority passed to USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service. Under the newly implemented program, 100% of catfish are inspected and regulated where previously only 2% of all imported catfish and catfish-like product were inspected. After only four months of enforcement, Senate Republicans, led by John McCain of Arizona, voted to end the inspection process handled by FSIS and return regulation to the FDA. Several catfish industry members went to Washington, D.C. just days before Congress recessed in August to rally U.S. House members to vote down the resolution. However, the legislation never made it to the floor. Hatcher, like many others, emphasizes the issue is about food safety and industry image. A fear I have, one batch comes in, gets a lot of people sick, they're going to paint this industry with a broad brush. Nobody's going to want to eat catfish again because they're going to say, that catfish made me sick, when they don't understand that this was from China or Vietnam or wherever it comes from, and this is U.S. farm-raised catfish. Many of those wishing to return inspection to the FDA say this is a political agenda brought forth by a small group of southern catfish industry members rather than a food safety issue. The National Fisheries Institute, a nonprofit organization made up of importers, exporters, producers, processors, and restaurants, among others, voiced opposition to the change in procedure and support lawmakers who want the mandate repealed. The reality is the folks who will be hurt the most by this in the long run are U.S. ag exports. Because what's likely to happen is if this program goes forward, there will be a WTO lawsuit from Vietnam or from China. And the U.S. will lose that lawsuit. And when they do lose that lawsuit, there will be retaliatory tariffs placed on U.S. ag exports. And the reason that U.S. ag exports will be targeted is that we don't export any catfish. Not a single whisker of catfish is exported from this country. So there is nothing in the catfish realm to retaliate against. So the real losers here are going to be corn, beef, soy, cotton, those type of exports. As the legislation wrangling continues in Congress, battle, like other producers, know they will continue to face opposition from those in Washington and foreign competition. And I told somebody not long ago, old boy trying to raise catfish in Mississippi never thought he'd be they need him to go to Washington and knock on doors in the House of Congress. I mean, it takes a lot to put fish in a box these days. It, it really does. For Market to Market, I'm Delaney Howell. Next, the Market to Market Report. A more expensive dollar, an increase in the size of the South American crop, and good export numbers left the market mixed. For the week, December wheat was off seven cents, and the nearby corn contract finished flat for the third consecutive week. News of a, Bra of a record large Brazilian soybean crop was balanced against positive export numbers as the November soybean contract rose three cents. December meal gained 60 cents per ton. In the softs, December cotton lost $1.10 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, November Class 3 milk futures fell 18 cents. In the livestock sector, prices finished mixed as the December cattle contract added $2.92, November feeders climbed $3.13, and the December lean hog contract shed $1.38, a 31% loss over six weeks. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index jumped 127 basis points. Crude oil advanced $1.57 per barrel. Gold melted 65.20 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index increased nearly seven points to finish the week at 370.90. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Tom Fitzenmeyer. Tom, welcome back. Thanks, Mike. Let's jump right into this here. We've got the wheat market. We've got reports of buildings going up to hold wheat for storage all across uh, wheat growing country. The market continues to, to trickle downward. How much lower can we go? Well, I don't know this trickled. I, I think we've stabilized wheat market. Actually, you know, we had that announcement this past week of a big sale to Morocco, which kind of 
boosted things up a little bit. I, I think we're base forming in wheat. I, I'm, and that's not to say we can't, December wheat can't, you know, move back down to 390 or 380, but I, I, don't, I don't think there's that much downside potential there. We, we've, we've got big crops, everybody knows it, but there's some quality problems around the world. Um, and, and I think that's going to throw some demand toward us. Uh, I, I think you're going to continue to see feed wheat being fed. Um, so I don't have any desire to get too bearish wheat here. I, 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 I think you could see, see a nice recovery rally into the winter in wheat back up into the, you know, four, four and a quarter, maybe 440 area. So I wouldn't get in a big toot to sell anything in wheat. I'd rather be long wheat down here than short. Okay. All right. And it's that high protein really seems to give us some, some additional value on the world scene as we look out to what, as you mentioned, yeah. troubles around the globe. Yeah, Rain's I, coming in Australia potentially and so on. And yep. We could see some opportunity. All right, so keep yeah. an eye out for, are you going to hold till four and a quarter or do you want to pull the trigger at 420? Yeah, I'd, pro I'd probably start s scaling out at 415 and then scale up from there up to and want to be out about 440. Um, yeah, uh, you know, they're going to start talking up the fact that maybe we aren't going to plant as much wheat next year and, and all that. The funds have a f fairly substantial short wheat position. So if anything comes along to trigger them to, uh, I mean, uh, you, you said earlier, the, the dollar is up at substantially higher levels and could go higher. Um, so, I mean, that, that's not going to be great for demand, so you, you don't want to get yourself too revved up here, but um, take advantage of a, of a rally if it comes along. All right. Now let's take a look at the corn market. Harvest is progressing across most places in the Corn Belt that didn't catch rain this past week. Right. What are, your, what are you hearing from producers about yield? You know, it's an interesting thing, and I kind of learned this from my grade point average in college, and maybe you did too, but <laughs> the... My grade point went up if I lowered the bottom up. If you know you cut out those lower ones and all of a sudden you're great. Well, the same thing I I see in the corn market. A lot of people are saying they're not getting record yields like they had been, but an awful awful lot of those guys that don't necessarily get great yields and are getting phenomenal yields at the bottom end. So I I think you're going to have a really solid corn crop because of that, not necessarily because. You know, we're going to have record high yields all over the place. It's consistency um, across the production area. Correct. I mean, the Dakotas sound quite good. Southern Iowa, for example, some very good yields down there, and they they can be hit and miss sometimes. So, yeah, I guess I don't think the USDA is all that far off in one, that 175. You know, maybe it's 174. I, you know, I wouldn't argue with that. But it, it, at those levels... You're talking a two, three, two, four, two, 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 five. I know somewhere carry out, and and that's too much corn, and it's going to be. I'm, and I'm not saying corn can't rally, because just like wheat, it can. Uh, and, and I don't want to get too bearish corn when you get under 330 to 325 D's corn. Uh, but we've got a lot coming at us. Uh, the other thing you've got is a farmer sitting on all this crop, and historically, we don't rally all that great with the farmer holding all the crop. Yeah. So I think you need to look at, watch basis. If you catch a good basis, use that to make some sales. Um, I, I don't think it's going to justify paying commercial storage, but certainly there's some carry out into July. Use on any, any nice rallies to, to capture that carry to make your bend do some work for you. Um, so there's going to be some opportunities here, uh, but you're going to have to kind of wiggle around to find them. Next week, next Wednesday, USDA comes out with their uh, their newest uh, World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates. Right. The trade seems to be anticipating corn yields are going to drop. Are you in that camp? Do you think we're going to see USDA well, lower yields? Why would they? The, the crop condition rating hasn't changed the entire summer. Every farmer you talk to has got great corn yields. What in the world would prompt the USDA to drop the yield very much? I mean, okay, we're going to run around saying July was hot and earweights are down and blah, blah. Okay, maybe, but that's not showing up on the from the farmers what we hear or read about. So, okay, they might drop it a little bit, but I, I don't think they're going to drop it much. I don't think they're going to make many adjustments on the demand side okay. on, on corn. All right. Taking a look at the soybean market, we've got a question here as we roll into the, the soybean conversation. This one's from Chad in Randalia, Iowa. Chad wants to know, his cash soybean contracts are filled. Should he store or sell the balance off the combine? I don't, I don't know if there's going to be a huge reward. 
Number one, I think bean yields could get bumped up a little bit. So if that happens, South America's off to a great start. And I understand the Chinese have been good buyers, but there's also the possibility that they've been hedging their bets a little bit, front end loading this demand in, because of all this La Nina talk, fearful that there could be a, some kind of a problem in South America because of that. So um, I, I don't know. I, for 30 years, all I've heard about is August weather makes beans, you know, Tom, you got to remember that. Was there a bad day in August? Seriously, if you're a bean plant every day over the whole country, it was a good day to be growing. So I, I just think that these, these bean yields could start to creep up. Now, I think there's an upper limit. You're probably not going to go above 55, but 52 to 54 is certainly a possibility. So are you going to be pretty aggressive on sales today if you've got unsold bushels that that i mean that that rally we had recently up to 990 or a little a little above i, I think it was a great opportunity to get some beans sold and if so, i didn't and what do you, you recommend and you catch a little bounce ahead of the report or after the report or whatever uh, i think use that to to get some catch-up sales made okay I, there's not that much carrying in charge in the market so there's not oh. tons of incentive to, to store beans anyway like there is in corn okay looking at this livestock market we saw live cattle turn positive for this week it looks like we've held that $99 level is that going to stay are we going to hold that price no okay where are we going I, I don't know I don't know I mean we're probably gonna hold it for a while we got, we got too many cattle, and, and, and we got beef prices too high. I mean, it looks like pork's going to continue to go lower. Poultry prices are lower. How, how in the world are we going to make beef prices go up? I mean, and, and then you've got cheaper corn, probably. That doesn't, certainly doesn't bode for lightweight cattle. So, I, I, I mean, we're, we're probably going to bounce around. You're probably going to get a chance to sell cattle two, three, four bucks better than what they're at today. But, but to say that there's no, no chance that the lows are going to be taken, I, I wouldn't say that. I think, I think this, this cattle cycle hasn't bottomed out yet. There's still a lot of hurting to be done. There's still a lot of optimism to be wrung out of that market, amazingly. Uh, so, I, you know, use rallies and cattle to get, to get sales made. Okay. We are going to be opening a market up with China, it sounds like, at some point. Does that give you much optimism as you look out maybe into 2017? Maybe. Okay. I, 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 don't, I don't see them beating the doors down to buy, to buy our beef. I mean, just because they say they're going to buy it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to buy it. If, if they come along and start buying huge chunks of beef like they have in beans, then, then I'm going to get excited. But until that happens, I... I, I and, and, and then we've got the, this uncertainty of the election. Is that going to affect one way or the other in terms of our relationship with China and exports and the, what, how that all goes? Uh, certainly, they're going to take South American and uh, Brazilian and Australian yeah. beef, um, too. And so we've got that competition. So uh, it's, it's a good thing. I hope we do. I hope we sell tons of it to them. But I don't know that in a short run that that's going to be all supportive of right. factor. We're not loading it on the boats today. That's no, we're for not. Sure. Look at the feeder cattle market. If we've got maybe some stability, at least for a little while here in the live cattle side, does that tell you we might find some stability here in the feeder cattle? Or are we just dealing with too many calves coming on the market? Well, there, there's that. I, I think there's... I mean, anytime you get a market a little oversold, it's it's bound to bounce. We're trying to sell uh, January feeders up in that 119 and a half to 121 and a half area, so a little bit higher than where we're at. Um, certainly, cheap corn is going to be tend to be supportive uh, of the feeder market, um, but I. I, I Again, that's another market where you just make lower highs and lower lows and you just keep grinding it down. And at some point, you're going to have to discourage for the beef market to really get better. At some point, you're going to have to discourage the feeder guy. Yeah. And the, the cattle feeder has been discouraged a lot or is being discouraged by their lenders to yeah. cut back. And, and some of these feedlots are, are hurting for well, sure. Western I, feedlots up in yeah. Canada closed down, 100,000 head capacity. And, and I know next week you're going to have Walt on, and, and I'm going to be really interested to watch the show just to see what, because he's really got a good handle on that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's got problems for sure. Okay. Speaking of problems, you touched on it, this pork market. We keep dropping every single 
single week, it seems like we've opened up a new door to the downside. Where's the bottom in this live uh, or in this uh, lean hog market? Well, the hog and pig report showed we continue to have expansion and continue to have more hogs. Weights are, could, I mean, we've had great weather for, for hogs too, so so that tends to add to the weight, weight on, on hogs. Um, I, I guess it looks to me like you're going to go into that 33 to 35 cent range in hogs. Any concern as Matthew works its way up the hurricane, works its way up the East Coast, we're going to impact North Carolina's processing abilities on the hog market at well, all? Well, it's, it's maybe, but it's, I think the bigger issue is it's going to disrupt the eating of eating of meats in general. I think it's a de demand is really going to overwhelm whatever whatever. Um, Packer interruptions there are. Okay. I, I just think that that's really the issue. People aren't going to a restaurant when there's a hurricane. Exactly right. Man, $33. So how far out do you want to be making some sales? If I'm a, a, an independent pork producer or a pork producer today, how far out should I be hedging in these markets? Well, I think, I mean, you, you've got June hogs still up there in the 70s. Why, why wouldn't you be selling some of that? And take, now, you get beyond that, and, and they're, they're already discounting that quite a bit. But, but out through June, I, I think any rallies you need to use to, to, to get additional coverage. Okay, go ahead and pull the trigger, put some protection on Yeah. the way uh, this thing's been going. Why leave yourself exposed to that kind of risk? All right. Well, f food for thought right there, Tom Fitzmaier. Thanks so much. All right, thanks, Mike. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market. But Tom and I will keep the market conversation going, including answering more of your questions during Market Plus, available on our website. And this week on M2M, get a first-hand look at our newest potential trading partner on that latest edition of the M2M podcast. You'll find it wherever you get podcasts by searching M-T-O-M. And join us again next week when we explore how one supermarket chain is slowing the growth of landfills by turning organic waste into cash. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.